God the Father, and we are introduced to God the Father in Genesis chapter 1 just at, by the name of God, which in the Hebrew is what? Elohim, yes, and that is his creator name all through Genesis chapter 1 and into Genesis chapter 2 through verse 3. God is just addressed or named as God, Elohim, and of course Elohim is plural. But beginning in Genesis 2, 4, then God is called Jehovah God. Jehovah is God's covenant name. God works through covenants. He has a covenant with nature. He has a covenant with man. Of course, we know God made covenant with Abraham. He made covenant with Noah. He made covenant with David, King David, and promised David a seed that would come forth from his body who would sit upon the throne of Israel. And, of course, that's a reference to Jesus. Uh, so we are also in covenant with God. And what is our covenant? The covenant of grace. Yes, we are under grace. Praise God. And, of course, then in the Old Testament, there was the covenant of the law of Moses, uh, which was conditional. And then last Sunday, we looked at the ways that Satan tried to block or stop the coming of Messiah. We looked at all of, or a number of schemes. There are many others throughout the Old Testament. I just chose six or seven to share with you at how Satan tried to stop the, um, the coming of Jesus Messiah Jesus into the human race and Satan knew that Messiah was going to be born into the human race because of the first prophecy of the coming of Jesus Messiah the deliverer and that's Genesis what 315 that's an important scripture you should remember that that's the first prophecy of Messiah Jesus Genesis 315 where God said uh, that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the seed of the serpent. So, uh, and of course, none of those schemes succeeded, did they? No. So, um, Messiah Jesus has come to us. Today, I want us to continue in the Old Testament, but we are looking, at, we're going to begin moving now to looking at Jesus Jesus, the second member of the Godhead, co-equal with the Father, God the Son. Someone has said, where is Jesus in the Old Testament? Jesus is very prominent in the Old Testament. Um, and, of course, we have looked at some of the theophanies, that is the Old Testament appearances of Jesus, the pre-incarnate, Pre-incarnate, and in the Old Testament, of course, he's not called Jesus. What is he called? Angel of the Lord. Yes, when you see Angel of the Lord, you know that is a reference to a theophany, which is a pre-incarnate or an Old Testament appearance of Jesus. Can you recall one off the top of your head? We've looked at a few of those. We're going to look at a couple more today. Pardon me? With Abraham, yes, to Abraham's tent, Genesis chapter 18, when uh, the Lord, Genesis 18, 1, the Lord came with two angels. Uh, let's look at one that we don't often think of, Genesis chapter 16, if you would look with me there. Genesis chapter 16, verse 7, and this is... An appearance to Hagar, and of course you know Hagar, of course, uh, Abraham had the son Ishmael with the Egyptian handmaiden Hagar. Sarah, the wife of Abraham, of course, when she learns that Hagar is pregnant with Abraham's child, she drives Hagar away, and she says that child will not be Whoops, I'm about to squeal here, Barrett. That, that child will not be heir with my son. So she drives Hagar away. If you'll look in chapter 16 of Genesis, verse 7. And the angel of the Lord. Now when you have capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D in the Hebrew, that's actually what name? Jehovah, yes, or Yahweh. 
God interpreted that name when he spoke to Moses as I am that I am. That's actually a translation of Jehovah or Yahweh. I am that I am. So what does that mean? God was saying, I exist because I exist. <laughs> I like to just meditate on that sometime. I exist because I exist. Yes, it was. Yes. Um, God was also saying, I was in the ancient past. I am in the present. I will be in the future. And how could God say that? It's because God is outside of time and space. We also looked at that. In Isaiah, God said, I know the end from the beginning. And he says, I sit upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants are as grasshoppers. I call out the host of the stars. I know each star by name. That is the God that we serve. And how can we doubt that? Father God can meet our needs. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. He is holy and righteous and true. He is love. He is well able to provide for our needs. So back to Genesis 16, 7. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar by the fountain of water in the wilderness, by the fountain in the way to Shur, and he said, Hagar, Sarah's maid, whence camest thou, and whither wilt thou go? And she said, I flee from the face of my mistress, Sarah. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Return to thy mistress, and submit thyself under her hands. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, that it shall not be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael. So... That's just one of the appearances of the angel of the Lord. Jesus is on every page of the Old Testament. We don't necessarily find his, we will not find his name there, and we don't always find angel of the Lord, but Jesus is on every page of the Old Testament, and in three ways, and I've given you those three ways on your outline. First, he is present in his pre-incarnate appearance as a theophany, as the angel of the Lord, as we've just looked at uh, his uh, Jesus appearing to Hagar here. And as Debbie said over in Genesis 18, where uh, Jesus, the angel of the Lord, comes with two angels to Abraham's tent. The angel of the Lord came to Elijah, came to Gideon, came to Manoah, the father of Samson. So... Jesus is present often throughout the Old Testament in his pre-incarnate state as the angel of the Lord. And then secondly, he is in the Old Testament in a pattern. Now, I have in the past, I've used the words type or shadow instead of pattern, or we could say illustration, the same thing. Jesus is in a type or a an illustration or a shadow. And then the third way is Jesus is prophesied. There are over 300, in fact, there are 332 prophecies of the first coming of Jesus. That does not include the many hundreds that prophesy of his second coming, of his reign upon the earth, all those in the Old Testament. And we're going to look at some of those Old Testament prophecies of his first coming. So we've looked at Jesus in, uh, on every page as being present from time to time in a pre-incarnate appearance. Uh, what about the pattern, that is the types and shadows? There are hundreds, I would guess I could even say thousands of types and shadows that point to Jesus that are illustrations, it's kind of like God giving a show and tell of the coming Messiah. For example, we could even start with Adam and Eve when God, after they fell and God provided the bloody skins to cover Adam and Eve. That was a pattern, that was a type or an illustration of covering sin with the blood of Jesus. Uh, the Passover lamb is an excellent type of Jesus 
in Exodus chapter 12 when God gave instructions to Moses about how they were to celebrate the Passover. Uh, God said, take a lamb, and there were requirements for that lamb. And what's the first one that comes to your mind? It must be without spot or blemish. Yes, so see that right there was pointing toward Jesus because Peter says, you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ as, as a lamb without spot or blemish. And of course, the, uh, the Passover lamb was to be, in Exodus chapter 12, it was to be a one-year one year old male, and one year speaks, of course, of innocence. There are a number of analogies of Jesus given in the Passover lamb. That's a beautiful study. Jesus is also patterned, or a type of Jesus, in the tabernacle and in the tabernacle furniture. That in itself would be an entire series that would take us months to cover. There are seven articles of furniture in, the, in Moses' tabernacle. Of course, entering into the courtyard, the first article of furniture that is see, seen is that huge uh, bronze altar. That's where the sacrifice was made. And, of course, that speaks of Jesus, our sacrifice. Then the priest would move to the laver, and at the laver there he had to wash before he entered into the temple, and that is cleansing from sin, cleansing by the word of God. Going into the tabernacle, on the left side is the golden menorah or lampstand, and, and, of course, just, in, just a simple explanation of that is to say Jesus is the light of the world. On the right side is the table of showbread with the loaves of bread, which symbolize Jesus as the bread of life. Yes, straight ahead is the small, smallest piece of furniture in the tabernacle. It's the altar of incense. That's the place of prayer, but it's also the place of intercession. What is Jesus doing at the right hand of the Father today? interceding, making intercession for us, then going th in through the veil into the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. There, of course, is the Ark of the Covenant where the uh, Shekinah glory of God resided, and on that is the golden mercy seat, and which the Hebrew word or the Greek word for that is propitiation, propitiation, the mercy seat, propitiation. In other words, taking our place, Jesus took our place on the cross and gave his blood. Uh, they're so, that, that's such a beautiful study of, of the tabernacle and all the furniture. The sacrifices are also a type or pattern of Jesus. The high priest in the Old Testament, the high priest is just an illustration of Jesus as our great high priest in the book of Hebrews uh, is a wonderful study on Jesus, our great high priest. Uh, and, of course, in the book of Ruth, how do we, where do we find Jesus in the book of Ruth? He, Boaz, and Boaz is what? The kinsman redeemer. Yes, Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. Uh, Joseph, in Genesis chapter, uh, the latter part of Genesis, Joseph is a type of Jesus. He is a type, a parallel of Jesus. You know, there are two main characters in the Old Testament that there is never a word of indictment or a negative word said about them. Joseph is one. Anybody know the other one? Well, Caleb, that's a good one. Yes. Um, Daniel is the one that I'm actually thinking of, Daniel being a main character, but you're right. Caleb, he wholly followed the Lord his God. Yes, that's a good one. Uh, there are over 100 parallels between, between the lives of Jesus and Joseph, and I'm not going to give you all of those, but I am going to give you 17. Uh, both Joseph and Jesus, and these are not on your outline, sorry. Both Joseph and Jesus were shepherds. Jesus, of course, says, I am the good shepherd. Uh, both Joseph and Jesus were beloved by their fathers. Both were sent to their brethren. Both were hated by their brothers. Both were rejected by their brothers. Both were unjustly accused and punished. 
Both Joseph and Jesus were sold for pieces of silver. Both were handed over to Gentiles. Both were placed in a pit. Both were raised from the pit. Both went down to Egypt. Both were tempted severely but did not sin. Both were cast into prison and numbered with criminals. Both were associated with two other criminals. One was pardoned, the other was not. Both received a Gentile bride. Now I won't ask you to remember the name of Joseph's Gentile bride because she was actually an Egyptian. But what's the name of Jesus' bride? The church, that's right. And both Jesus and Joseph were 30 years old when they began their life's work. Both were the single source of bread. Isn't that amazing? And that's only 17. There are over 100 of those parallels. So Jesus is on every page of the Old Testament. He is present in his pre-incarnate appearance as the angel of the Lord. Secondly, he is presented in the Old Testament in patterns or types or shadows, what we've just looked at. And then thirdly, he is prophesied. Uh, would you turn over in, your, uh, in the New Testament to 2 Peter chapter 1, 2 Peter chapter 1, and we're going to talk about the prophecies of Jesus and what Peter had to say about those prophecies. 2 Peter chapter 1. Now, of course, Peter lived with Jesus, sat under Jesus' teaching for those three years. Peter, was, Peter, James, and John were with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration when Moses and Elijah came down on the mount and talked with Jesus about his coming death. Jesus was seen in his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter and James and John were eyewitnesses of that. And John mentions that, uh, Peter mentions that in this passage, 2 Peter 1, starting with verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And he's referring to that time on the Mount of Transfiguration. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, and of course that was the Father speaking, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven when we heard, we heard when we were with him in the holy mountain. But then Peter says, but we have also a more sure word of prophecy. He's saying, I've got even greater proof then when I saw Jesus in his glory talking with Moses and Elijah, I've got even greater proof. And could there be anything greater than seeing Jesus literally in his glory and seeing him transfigured, talking there with Moses and Elijah? Well, Peter says he did, and here's how he, what he says it is, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Another translation of that says, we have also a word, a, a prophecy that a, we have proof that does not waver and will not fail. We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto you will do well if you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Now, what is that word of prophecy that he's talking about? Peter's referring to all of those prophecies that are given in the Old Te what we know as the Old Testament. He knew them as Moses and the prophets and the writings. That's how they're referred to in the New Testament. But those prophecies that were given, Peter says, that is an absolute proof because Jesus has fulfilled those prophecies. Now, there are 332 prophecies just of his first coming. So how many of those did Jesus fulfill at his first coming? Every single one. Yes, every single one. Exactly. Um, I gave you, uh, in fact, let me back up here. In Luke chapter 24, I think I gave you that on your outline. Yes, look on your outline at C. We're still at the top of the page. 
Jesus is prophesied in 300 plus prophecies, actually 332, of his first com coming. There are hundreds more that speak of his second coming and his reign upon the earth, but here we're looking only at the first coming prophecies. Now look at number one. Jesus made this statement in Luke. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Would anybody happen to know the setting when this verse is given in Luke chapter 24? The Ewan First Baptist Church has a very famous song about this setting. Road to Emmaus, that's right. On the road to Emmaus, when Jesus fell into, the resurrected Jesus fell into step with the two visitors, and they were discussing the things that had just happened in Jerusalem, the man that they thought was their deliverer, and he had been crucified. And then Jesus, I believe that's the occasion when Jesus says, Oh, slow of heart. <laughs> And Jesus begins at Moses and all the prophets. In other words, Jesus begins to go through those Old Testament prophecies and explain how he has fulfilled each one of those. Now, on, on your outline, I've given you eight of the most well-known prophecies in the Old Testament concerning Jesus' first coming. Now, this is just eight, and you are familiar with these, but let's look at them. He will be born in Bethlehem, Micah 5.2. The king will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, Zechariah 9.9. 9. He will be sold for 30 pieces of silver, Zechariah 11.12. The betrayal money will buy a potter's field, Zechariah 11.13. Messiah will be born of a virgin, Isaiah 7.14. His name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9.6. They parted my garments and cast lots for my vesture. That's stated in Psalm 22, verse 18. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Isaiah 53, 7. Now, those of you that have been, in, been with me for several years, you have heard me, this is one of my favorite things to do, to say, what are the odds? Now, some of you are going to groan because you've heard this so many times. But we have some people in this class that never heard that. So if the one person in this class has not heard it, I'm going, to, <laughs> I'm going to share it with you. What are the odds of one man fulfilling these eight prophecies? And I gave you that on your outline. What are the odds of one man fulfilling just eight of the prophecies? It's one in ten to the 28th power. In other words, it's one in ten with 28 zeros following it. Now, I, I, I don't know how many... I think that's like a billion trillion, I don't know, but it's, <laughs> I didn't take calculus in college, so <laughs> I didn't take any math in college. Oh, a, a man named Peter Stoner, who was a professor of uh, mathematics at a college, he did that as a project with one of his math classes, and it was so intriguing, he wrote, actually wrote a book about it. And it's called Science Speaks. And I think that, I want to say it was 1951 when that book was published. So if you have one, uh, one man fulfilling just eight of these prophecies, one in ten to the 28th power, uh, another way that Peter Stoner expresses it, for those of us whose minds can't wrap around 10 to the 28th power, um, I, didn't, I said I didn't take calculus, neither did I take statistics. I heard horror stories about statistics in college. Mm -mm, didn't go there. Um, Peter Stoner gives a simpler illustration. He says, go to the state of Texas and fill it two feet deep with silver dollars. That's the state of Texas now. Fill it two feet deep with silver dollars. Take one silver dollar and make a mark on it and toss it out there in the state of Texas somewhere and then let someone walk out blindfolded, into the, wade out into all of these silver dollars and pick up the one that has the red mark. What are the chances of a person being able to do that? 
I would say practically none. <laughs> it's one to the tenth with 28 zeros following it. That's amazing, isn't it? But then let's think about 16 prophecies. Now, I told you there are over 300 prophecies. So what are the odds of one man fulfilling 16 prophecies? That would be 1 in 10 to the 45th power. 1 in 10 with 45 zeros following it. Anybody want a chance pronouncing that number? It's a bunch of trillions. I know, I looked it up. It's a bunch of trillions. So that's pretty amazing. We won't even go to 48. Stoner takes it on to 48. But then he just stops with 48 because he says when you try to figure up the odds of one man fulfilling over 300 prophecies, it's an absolutely unpronounceable number. So no wonder Peter says we have a more sure word of prophecy. And he hadn't even read the book of Science Speaks. He just, Peter knew that Jesus had fulfilled those prophecies. And it was absolutely valid. It was absolutely indisputable that Jesus was the Messiah because he had fulfilled these prophecies. Now, I've just mentioned that Jesus is on every page in the Old Testament, either presented as the pre-incarnate angel of the Lord, or else he is patterned in types or shadows, or else he is prophesied. There is one passage of scripture that I knew just off the top of my head, where all three of those are given in that single passage, and I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis 22. Now, if, if this were a college class... I would tell you to take Genesis 22 and find all three of these uh, applications of Jesus in this passage. Find him as uh, a find him as being present. Find him as being a pattern. Find him as being prophesied. It's actually very easy. This, of course, is when God tells Abraham to take his son Isaac to Mount Moriah and there to sacrifice him. And this is an illustration, a pattern, a type, or a shadow of what? Of Jesus going up on Mount Moriah, same mountain. <laughs> and there he is, he is sacrificed. Isaac was not sacrificed because he was stopped, or Abraham was stopped before he killed Isaac as the sacrifice. Let's look at Jesus in the pattern, the pattern, the type, or the shadow. Verse 2, And God said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him therefore a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee of. Now drop down to verse... Um, Oh, there's so many applications there, but I, I want to move on here. Drop down to verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering. Now, Abraham took what? The wood and laid it upon Isaac, his son. What's the, what's the type there or shadow? Jesus taking the cross, yes. Abraham took the fire in his hand and a knife, and they went both together. The fire of judgment and wrath. And, of course, Jesus suffered the fire of God's wrath upon the cross. Jesus took the wrath that should come to you and to me. Yes, Mark. Right. A absolutely. Yes, there are so many other applications in that passage there. It's, it's such a... a it's almost startling to look at the number of applications. So anyway, that's, um, that's how Jesus is presented in pattern. Where is Jesus prophesied in this passage? I bet you've already found it. Scan it and see if you find it. Verse 8. And Abraham said, My son, 
God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. God will give himself as a burnt offering. And of course, we know that's what Jesus did. He provided himself as the lamb. And then, of course, Jesus is present at this, in this setting. Where is Jesus present? Verse 11, And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. I hope as you read, especially in the Old Testament, that you will be conscious of looking for Jesus as, a, as being present as the angel of the Lord or as a pattern, a type or a shadow or an illustration, as well as being prophesied. There are so many other prophetic scriptures that we could look at, but I, I want to move on because I want to get to Daniel. There are three chapters that I want to point out to you as being, uh, these are the most detailed chapters. Now, like I said, there are hundreds of verses, random verses, but as far as entire chapters, if you will, just flip over to Isaiah 53. This, to me, Isaiah 53 is the jewel of the Old Testament. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? He shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Look at verse 3, Isaiah 53, 3. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. This is, God gave Isaiah a very graphic and detailed account of the crucifixion of Jesus. Verse 4, surely he hath borne, that word borne is the Hebrew word nasa, N-A-S-A. NASA. I think there's some significance to that. Surely he has borne away our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Jesus bore all the sins of humanity. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. I heard Rick Renner a few months ago teaching on this passage, and he brought out a point. He's a Greek scholar he brought out a point about that phrase, he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. That word brought there is, is literally the word led. He is led as a lamb to the slaughter. And Rick Renner said the way a lamb was led to the slaughter, there was a rope that was placed around the neck of the lamb and it was led to the place of sacrifice. Rick Renner says a rope was placed around the neck of Jesus. And he was led to the place of sacrifice. He is led as a lamb to the slaughter. That's such a beautiful, beautiful chapter. Well, uh, let's go back to Psalm 22 and look briefly at that one. And then we're going to go to Daniel and spend a few minutes on that passage. Daniel chapter 22. I'm sorry. Psalm 22. Psalm 22. I hope that you will read the entire Psalm 22 today or in the coming days very soon and just meditate on this chapter as well as on Isaiah 53. Psalm 22. And by the way, keep in mind, David penned this a thousand years before Jesus ever walked the earth as Messiah Jesus. The opening words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And of course that brings to our remembrance 
what? The words of Jesus on the cross. So this, this again is, look at verse 18. Just drop down to verse 18. And these prophetic psalms, there are messianic psalms. They're called messianic psalms. They're prophecies of Jesus. There are a number of messianic psalms. Um, give us added detail especially of what was going on in the mind of Jesus when he was on the, uh, here in Psalm 22, what was going through his mind and his spirit while he was on the cross. Um, look at verse 18 of Psalm 22. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. So please take time to read Psalm 22 in the next day or so. If you will, go on over to the right to the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 9. Now, again, those of you that have been with me for a long time, you've heard me teach this passage, but I'm not going to teach all the details because you can't teach all of this passage in the 10 minutes that we have remaining. I want to just focus on um, the prophecy of Jesus Jesus' first coming that's given in this passage. My friend Chuck Missler called Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, the most amazing prophecy in all the Old Testament. The most amazing. Uh, beginning at verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. This is God speaking to Daniel. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Now, right there, don't start rolling your eyes. <laughs> oh, those 70 weeks. Actually, I know it, re it sounds complicated when you read this. It's actually not complicated at all, and I hope I can simplify this. God was simply saying 70 weeks, and in the Jewish terminology, one week, we think of one week as seven days, but in the Jewish concept, one week was actually speaking of what? Seven years, yes. Like when we read that Jacob fulfilled his week for Rachel, that didn't mean he just worked seven days. He had to work seven more years. He'd already worked seven years, for, and he got Leah. So now he's got to work seven more years. He fulfilled his week for Rachel. Not seven days, but seven years. So you've got to think in terms of one week equals seven years. So if one week is seven years, how many years is 70 weeks? 490. Seven times 70, 490. God is saying, I'm going to deal with the Jews 490 more years. I'm giving them, I'm setting this time frame. I'm going to deal with them after the Babylonian captivity. You see, they're about to go back. They've been in Babylon. They're about to, their, their time of exile in Babylon is just about up, and they're going to go back. They're going to have to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. They're going to have to rebuild the temple because the Babylonians had burned everything in Jerusalem. But God says from this point, I'm going to deal with my people Israel for 490 years. That's, the, that's what I'm giving them, 490 years. Now, God divided that period of time of 490 years into three segments. So let's go to verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince, and who is Messiah the Prince? Jesus. You see, God's about to reveal the time when Jesus is going to ride into Jerusalem on the donkey. <laughs> Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks. Now, what's seven weeks? How many years is that? Seven times seven. Forty-nine years. God is saying it's going to take 49 years to rebuild Jerusalem. That's the first segment of time. And three score and two weeks. That's 62 weeks. 
So now this is the second segment of time. Now we're going to look at this on a chart in just a minute. So if you're if your brain is already whirring, don't worry, we're going to look at a chart. How many years is 62 weeks? 62 times 7 is actually 434 years. The street shall be built again in the wall, even in troublesome times. And after three score and two weeks, after that second segment of time of 62 weeks or 434 years, Messiah shall be cut off. In other words, he will be crucified. Cut off is a way of saying stoned or crucified. Now stop right there. That's as far as we're going. Now there's a whole lot of other prophecy in the rest of this passage here, but I only want to deal with those uh, with this the timing of Jesus entering into Jerusalem. So if you will look on your outline. Okay, down toward the bottom. There at Roman numeral 4, look at B, the B point. A week in Jewish terminology is speaking of seven years. So seven weeks is actually referring to 49 years. Seven times seven, 49 years. And then the 62 weeks is referring to 434 years. How did I come up with 434 years? 62 times 7. 62 weeks. One week is seven years, so 62 times 7. So I gave you this little chart here. God said that the timeline will start with the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. So the question is, when was the commandment given to rebuild Jerusalem? Do you know history has recorded that date for us? When the Persian king Artaxerxes... When he issued the decree, and it was actually March 14th, 445 B.C. March 14th, 445 B.C. So God is saying from the time of that edict, that command to rebuild Jerusalem, the first time frame is 49 years. And that's, that's how long it'll take to build the walls, to build the temple, to clean up Jerusalem, get it habitable again. Now we come to the second segment of time. Then God says after 62 weeks, and I told you that would be 434 years. God says after that 434 years, that 62 weeks, that Messiah Jesus is going to enter into Jerusalem. Now before we move on, when you add up 49 years and 434 years, what's your total? I made it easy for you. 483 years. But now God said he was going to deal with the Jews how many years? 490. So there's seven years missing somewhere. That's right. That seven-year period has not come around yet. It is the seven-year period of the tribulation. That is when God will deal with the Jews during that seven-year tribulation. And that will complete the 490 years. We're only dealing with these first two periods of time. The first segment of time, 49 years to build the temple and the walls. And then the second period of time, that 434 years. But God says at the end of that 434-year segment, Messiah Jesus is going to ride into Jerusalem. He's going to enter Jerusalem, and he will be crucified. Yes. Yes, it did. That's right. That's the church age in there. Yes. At the end of the church age, and when does the church age end? At the rapture. When it, the age of grace will end at the rapture. When the church is removed, then Israel's prophetic clock is going to kick in, and God will once again turn to the Jewish people. Do you know that is one of the main reasons for the tribulation is for God to return once more to the Jews to draw them to himself. You know, Paul says uh, blindness in part has happened to, has come upon Israel. Blindness in part. 
You see, when they rejected Jesus, that's when their minds, their spirits were closed to Messiah Jesus. And their minds and their spirits are still closed. I know there are some who have accepted Jesus. They're called Messianic Jews. But the, by and large, the majority of Jews still reject Jesus. But when the church is removed, God will once more begin dealing with the Jews. That's why the tribulation is not for the church. It is not for the church. It is God, the, the point of the, uh, of the tribulation is to, for God to deal with evil in the world, for him to deal with the Antichrist false prophet as well as Satan, and also to deal with the Jews, to bring the Jews to himself. Will the Jews turn to Jesus? They sure will. It'll be toward the end of the seven years, however. They'll have to go through a lot of suffering, a lot of persecution, a lot of death, but they will cry out for Jesus. Well, I, and it could be, yes. But for, uh, for the peace of Jerusalem and also for the eyes of the people of Israel, for their eyes to be open to truth. That's why we need to be praying for the Jewish, Jewish people. So anyway, we're dealing with those first two blocks of time. Well, a man named Sir Robert Anderson, this was in 1881, a brilliant man. He actually worked for Scotland Yard. Then he went on to become one of the greatest Christian apologists of his time. And he was meditating on this prophecy where God had said after the 49 years and after the 434 years, then Messiah Jesus will enter Jerusalem. And so Sir Robert Anderson, the wheels began to turn, and he was like, well, I wonder, did Jesus really enter Jerusalem on that date that was projected? So he set about to see if Jesus really did enter Jerusalem on that projected date. So he took the 483 years, and of course a Jewish year is 360 days. So he took the 483 years, and he figured up how many days is that. Now, it's not just a simple matter of multiplying 434 times 360. You have some factors that you have to factor into that. For example, there is no zero year. So when he got to 1 B.C., and then suddenly it kicked over to 1 A.D., you don't have a year of zero. Also, in a Jewish year, there are extra days built in uh, for, like we have a uh, leap year. We have one day built in every four years. The Jewish calendar has, there are, uh, on their calendar, there are extra days that they have built in. They do not use the same calendar that we do. So anyway, Sir Robert Anderson took all of that into account, and when he figured up how many days is it from... The March 14th, 445 B.C., when the commandment was give, given to uh, rebuild Jerusalem, until this point of time when the prophecy said Jesus would enter Jerusalem, he said that, was, that came to a total of 173,880 days. By the way, Robert Anderson went on to write a book about this called The Coming Prince. So counting, look at your outline Counting 173,880 days from March 14th, 445 B.C. forward, arrives at the day, our date of April 6, 32 A.D. So, did Jesus arrive on April 6, 32 A.D.? Well, let's see. Let's go to John chapter 12. I'm going to have to do this quickly. John chapter 12. I'll go ahead and tell you he did. <laughs> I know you're in suspense. All right, John chapter 12, verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover. So now if we know when Passover is, see, we can start coordinating with our calendar, our Julian. Julian, is that the calendar we use? Julian calendar. So, if Passover is on the 14th, the month Nisan, and it's the Hebrew month Nisan, is 
Nisan 14. Well, let's back up six days. That would be Nisan 9. On the ninth day of Nisan. Six days. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Yes, so that's right. So on the ninth day of Nisan, Jesus came to Bethany. But look at verse 12. On the next day, on the next day, so if Jesus arrived in Bethany on the ninth day of Nisan, and the next day he went to Jerusalem, what would be the date? Tenth day of Nisan. The tenth day of Nisan. Verse 12, on the next day, that is the tenth day of Nisan, much people that were come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that comes in the name of the Lord. This is when Jesus came and sitting on the donkey, as verse 15 tells us. So, Jesus entered Jerusalem on the 10th day of Nisan. So now all we've got to do is just synchronize with our calendar. Well, Sir Robert Anderson, he did that for us. And when he synchronized that, 